We as humans like to think of ourselves as pretty clever, and for good reason. We've come up with some pretty amazing things. The tuxedo t-shirt, the squatty potty, just to name a few. But we would be lying if we didn't admit that we got quite a bit of inspiration from Mother Nature. Biomimicry. Drag reducing winglets you see on modern airplanes were inspired by high speed birds. Or serrated edge wind turbines inspired by protrusions on a humpback whale's fin. But today we're talking about the OGs of converting sunlight to energy. Plants and their system of photosynthesis, which converts sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water into energy, leaving only oxygen as waste. But if you're thinking we already have solar panels, well, you're thinking of photovoltaic panels, which is completely different. We'll get to that in just a bit. But is it possible for humans to tap into artificial photosynthesis and might it be the future of renewable energy? Or is it just another green pipe dream? We thought these questions deserved a deeper dive here on 2Bit Da Vinci. Special thanks to Aspiration for sponsoring this video. Get the Aspiration card and start planting trees with every purchase today. Every hour, the sun bombards the earth with more power than the global population consumes in one year. But when it comes to harnessing all that potential energy, we've barely begun to scratch the surface. In 2018, solar produced just 2% of the world's electricity, according to the Centers of Climate and Energy Solutions. As I mentioned, the solar panels you're probably thinking about are called photovoltaic or PV solar panels. And while they're not exactly efficient, According to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, most solar panels on the market are between 15 and 20% efficient. To better understand why our PV panels are just so inefficient, let's take a quick moment to talk about how they work. The photoelectric effect was first noted by French physicist Edmond Becquerel all the way back in 1839. The first PV module was built by Bell Labs in 1954. The technology works like this. A thin semiconductor wafer, typically of silicon, is specially treated to form an electric field, positive on one side and negative on the other. When light hits it, more specifically when photons and sunlight strike the panel, electrons are knocked loose from the atoms in the semiconductor material. If we attach electric conductors to the positive and negative sides, we can then form an electrical circuit. If you want to learn more about how solar cells are put together into panels and into bigger systems, check out my recent video on how my solar panels just turned 10 years old. This technology has improved significantly over the decades, and today's best panels can break 20% efficiency. But this energy has to be used as soon as it's created. In California, we have so much solar generation that oftentimes, some of that solar energy is wasted at times like high noon, as we have more generation than demand. This is where artificial photosynthesis becomes quite interesting. As we mentioned in the intro, the reigning champs of clean energy production are plants and algae and some types of bacteria. Over billions of years, these organisms have developed the most efficient form of energy production in the world, photosynthesis. Natural photosynthesis is a beautifully designed evolutionary process by which organisms can generate their own food while producing clean, pure oxygen as a byproduct. In fact, photosynthesis is responsible for all the energy circulating among the biological community in the great circle of life. So the next time you go outside, be sure to thank the plants. Before we get back to the show, let me tell you about our sponsor, Aspiration. We live in an age where we expect our companies to not just do well, but to do good. But we often don't think this way about our finances. Unlike the big banks, Aspiration doesn't use your deposits to fund oil pipelines or turn your fees into campaign contributions for politicians working against you. Instead, Aspiration offers a spend and save account, a debit card with some pretty awesome perks. I've seen cards that allow rounding up purchases to save, which is awesome. But I already save. What I'm not doing is planting trees. And with Aspiration, I can now round up purchases and do just that. With the Aspiration Plus card, they'll even buy carbon credits to offset all your gas purchases if you're not quite all electric just yet. Aspiration is also a B certified corporation, member of 1% for the planet, and even pledges 10% of their profits for charity. But don't think their awesome mission means you're getting anything less than stellar service. With access to a network of over 55,000 ATMs, FDIC insurance on your deposits, cutting in security, this is finance for the next century. As a special offer for our viewers, go to joinaspiration.com slash Vinci or click on the link in the description to get $50 when you sign up and start planting trees with every purchase today. So first let's break down how photosynthesis works. Now, this will be a heavy simplification. So if we leave something out, we trust you'll kindly let us know in the comment section. 
First, the plants absorb water through their roots and breathe in carbon dioxide through their stomata, tiny openings located on their leaves. As the plants breathe in, they also harvest sunlight photons through their antenna, a collection of pigment molecules like chlorophyll. The organism then transfers the light energy to their reaction center, where that energy excites the chlorophyll molecule, causing them to release an electron. The electron travels through a transport chain where the charges are then recombined to form usable electrochemical energy in the form of molecules like adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. From here, the ATP moves into the plant's stroma for what's known as the Calvin cycle. Here, an enzyme complex of manganese and calcium bind the water molecules in place while separating the protons, hydrogen, and electrons, which go back to the chlorophyll to fill its, um, hole leaving nothing but pure oxygen. At the same time, CO2 is gaining electrons with the help of ATP, which then produces carbohydrates like glucose. Pretty amazing. It's this exact process that researchers are attempting to replicate, but instead of producing carbohydrates, researchers hope to use artificial photosynthesis to create fuel, which is good news because carbohydrates are persona non grata today in our low carb diets. In particular, hydrogen, which can either be used directly as fuel or funneled into fuel cells to power things like cars and even homes, and methanol, which can be used in a variety of ways as well. That's the beauty of this technology. Unlike current photovoltaic cells, which convert solar energy into electricity on the spot, photosynthesis semiconductors absorb the energy from the sun in chemical bonds to be used whenever, wherever. This, in theory, solves many of the problems inherent in today's solar technology. Intermittency, no problem. Create fuel when it's sunny, use it when it's dark, and best of all, no need for batteries. The trick has been finding the means to synthetically recreate this incredible process in an efficient and cost-effective way. Well, just like in real photoautotrophs, that's organisms that can photosynthesize, the first step is absorbing light photons. Believe it or not, this is one area where plants are relatively limited only as efficient as the light absorbing capacities of their pigment. Most plants, as we know, are green, meaning they only absorb light waves within that spectrum. Most photoautotrophs can only absorb light within the range of 400 to 700 nanometers, which makes up only about 50% of the light spectrum from the sun. Of course, plants are only trying to absorb enough energy to ensure their survival. If humans want to truly harness the power of the sun, we'd need something better, more efficient, and faster at converting light into fuel. One of the earliest developments in artificial photosynthesis came in 1972 when researcher Kenichi Honda and his student Akira Fujishima created the first successful water splitting device powered by light. A photoelectrochemical cell comprised of a titanium dioxide photoanode and a platinum black cathode, which was completely submerged in water. Many of today's artificial photosynthesis devices, or APs, utilize the Honda Fujishima effect using a titanium dioxide photoanode as a light absorber and catalyst. One major drawback of these devices, however, is that they only absorb ultraviolet light. So again, missing out on the wider spectrum of available light. One promising material is silicon because not only is it cheap and widely available, it can absorb a wider spectrum of light, up to 1100 nanometers. Professors Pamela Silver and Daniel Nocera of Harvard University have utilized silicon in developing their bionic leaf. The leaf really looks more like a cyberpunk postage stamp, a silicon wafer with a cobalt based layer on one side and a nickel molybdenum zinc alloy on the other. Early models featured platinum instead of cobalt, but you know, that stuff ain't cheap. When the wafer is submerged in water, incoming photons are converted into electricity, which then channels into the leaf's outer layers, releasing hydrogen from one side and oxygen from the other. Nocera says that these bionic leaves can reach efficiencies of between 70 and 80%, and that this technology is constantly improving. That beats out the 1% efficiency of plants and even the 20% efficiency of most solar panels. Another option in development by researchers from the Hassel University in Belgium is the application of thin film solar cells that can be rolled out like a tarp to collect solar energy and water. In 2020, the group became the first to achieve an energy efficiency of 25% from a thin film solar cell. Better, more efficient light absorbing cells are the first part of the equation, but the true meat and potatoes of artificial photosynthesis is the water splitting. Water splitting involves the decomposition of water and oxygen into hydrogen by the means of a chemical redox reaction. The process requires a catalyst, something to kick the whole thing off. One common option as used in the bionic leaf involves a photoelectrochemical cell 
with some form of membrane to separate the protons, neutrons, and electrons. A common catalytic element is manganese, since it's what most plants use. A single atom of manganese triggers a natural process that uses sunlight to split water. Another common material is cobalt oxide because it's stable, efficient, and somewhat abundant. There are numerous projects exploring this technology all around the world. It'd be impossible to cover them all in this one video. While many of these projects have been going on for a number of years, they show no signs of slowing down. In fact, in July 2020, the US Department of Energy announced a five-year funding plan of $100 million toward the research of artificial photosynthesis. The benefits of this technology can't be understated. As we mentioned, they solve issues like energy storage and intermittency because they essentially create their own fuel. Artificial photosynthesis could have a significantly negative carbon footprint and that one key component is, well, carbon dioxide, you know, that stuff that's cooking our planet. They could also help bring stability to the world by decentralizing fuel production, allowing just about any country to develop their own energy from just about anywhere the sun shines. To compare AP cells to our current PV cells, it helps think of it like this. PV panels can produce electricity for immediate consumption. If you want to store it, you'll have to send it into some storage medium like a battery. If you decided instead to use solar to power electrolysis to produce green hydrogen, then you have another inefficient operation to consider. But with an AP cell, you don't create electricity immediately, but instead, through a chemical reaction, eliminate CO2 from the air, add oxygen back in, and produce hydrogen. This sort of technology is why I have always supported hydrogen as a fuel for the future. I do not think hydrogen will be used in personal vehicles, as battery electric is just far too convenient and viable. But the airplanes, cruise ships, and cargo vessels of tomorrow might just be powered by hydrogen sourced from artificial photosynthesis. So awesome, sign me up, cover my house with artificial flowers and let's get this fuel flowing, right? Unfortunately, the technology isn't quite ready for the masses just yet. While researchers have made incredible strides, conservative estimates say we may not really see artificial photosynthesis in the marketplace for at least another 10 to 15 years, if not much longer. One major hill researchers still need to summit is landing on suitable catalyst materials. While manganese and cobalt have proven efficient, they tend to suffer from instability and degradation over time. This happens in plants all the time, but plants intrinsically perform self-repair. What can't be repaired can be shed and new leaves grown. That's not so easy for artificial systems. Another issue with inorganic metal oxides is that they often lack the necessary speed for converting photons into energy, and the materials that do have speed tend to be a lot more expensive. Like a lot of the really cool research and development we see happening in energy storage and solar, this too is going to need a fair bit of maturity. The concept is quite proven. In fact, it's inspired by nature. But the next decade of research will be how we take this and build a sustainable product that can operate for decades, like our current PV panels can. Much thought needs to be paid to the elements we decide on. Cobalt, for example, has humanitarian drawbacks with its mining. But the fact that there are so many researchers making such great strides is a sign of hope. We've only really scratched the surface of what's in the works. But let us know what you think. How do you feel about artificial photosynthesis? Are there any developments that you know about that we missed? Let us know in the comments section. I think this really is a game changer and this is exactly the sort of research and breakthrough that I keep alluding to when I talked about hydrogen and why we shouldn't just dismiss it. Sure, hydrogen doesn't make any sense for cars like our commercial passenger cars because battery electric is far better. But a breakthrough like this that can bring hydrogen prices down could really spell incredible potential for the future. And that's what I've always said, let's invest in everything and you never know what breakthroughs are around the corner and around the bend. So this story was one of my favorite ones of the week or the month and I cannot wait to see AP panels next to PV panels. So imagine a field of solar panels in the future where they alternate one photovoltaic for making energy right now and being sent to the grid for immediate consumption, and then a AP panel that is making hydrogen fuel that is being stored for the evening when the sun goes down. By doing that, we could stabilize our grid and produce energy all day. All of that without the need for any batteries, which on large scale infrastructure improvement plans, I think will appeal to a lot of utilities. All right, so that pretty much does it for us here with 2-Bit DaVinci. Thank you guys so much for watching and a huge thank you to all of our 2-Bit Tribe members. Our 2-Bit Tribe is a group of our patrons on Patreon and our YouTube channel members. 
You guys are on our Discord together. We chat about future ideas. We do research together. And you guys make this show possible. So if you want to be a rock star supporter of the show and join our community and chat on a daily basis, become a patron on Patreon or a YouTube channel member. We'll have links in the description. Also take a look around. We have a ton of other videos that we think you'll love. I'm Ricky with Tuba Da Vinci. And just remember, the future is going to be awesome.